Let's dive right in. Today's video follows a bit of a different format, and is part of a broader look I'll be taking at how to make covers for scientific journals using Blender. To clarify ahead of time, this isn't a full tutorial. It's a mix of setup and some general advice I've found helpful when designing journal art specifically. Ultimately, I hope to make some lazy tutorials in the style of Ian Hubert for replicating some of my favorite published covers using a variety of shortcuts and resources. But for now, let's get into how to set up Blender for making covers. Before you do anything else, check out the covers the journal already publishes. Many have a particular style or look they go after. That shouldn't limit your scientific message or creative expression, but it might help inform it. You can see here I have a very extensive collection of covers from the Wiley family of advanced materials journals. One thing that all of these have in common is they share a very similar aspect ratio, and it's safe to assume that most covers will be either US letter size or A4. Framing is a very important part of scene setup, so from the get-go it's best to change your resolution to reflect this. Also, most standard print houses and journals ultimately ask for a 300 dpi resolution image, often in a .tiff format. Coming back to Blender, if we were to render pretty much any scene, we would almost always get a 72 dpi image, and that's because Blender doesn't actually allow you to set the dpi per se. Instead, you set the pixel count based on the size of the image. Also, you'll notice that our starting camera has a rectangular aspect ratio that is wider than it is tall. To adjust this, we're simply going to come to Output, and then under Resolution for X and Y, we're going to change it to the dimensions of a US letter size or A4 sheet. To do that, you can very simply enter in 300, 300 dpi times 8.5 inches to get the X dimension, and then 300 times 11 to get the Y dimension. If you want to do this for A4, you would similarly add in those numbers. For printing, it's also common to add in a little bit of extra resolution or bleed, corresponding to an extra eighth of an inch. For letter size, that corresponds to 2,265 pixels, and then in the Y direction that'll be 3,375. If you're going to be using these presets frequently, you can save them by clicking this little icon here for render presets, choosing to name the preset and adding a new one. You can see that I have letter size and letter size plus bleed saved in my Blender. You'll also notice that our camera has changed its aspect ratio. And if we were to hit number pad zero or come to the active camera view, then what you would see is that we now have the correct ratio for creating a journal cover. From here, if I were to go ahead and render this image and then open it in image processing software, such as Photoshop, you would be able to see that under image and image size, I actually have a 72 DPI resolution. However, if I change to inches, you can see the actual size is far beyond the eight and a half and 11 that I need. So simply make sure that resample image is unchecked and then change the width to eight and a half. Everything will adjust accordingly and this will give you the proper file output. You haven't actually changed or resampled everything. You've just rearranged the metadata for the picture. So you could send this to your journal print house and they should have no issues. Even if you send them the version that's 72 DPI, the right number of pixels is contained in the file, so it still should not be a problem. While most covers focus on the scientific subject at hand, there are plenty that make use of more standard or non-standard backgrounds or objects. It's not uncommon to see landscapes, architecture, electronic devices, people, etc. in a cover. Go ahead and pause and actually peruse the number that I have on the screen, and you'll be able to find some of those elements quite quickly. While it is possible to model these yourself, I strongly encourage using existing assets, preferably free ones. Some journals will ask if everything in the image is original and may take issue if it isn't. If you're concerned about this, you can either make everything yourself or rely on CC0 public domain models. Of course, you can also purchase assets from providers such as TurboSquid and Sketchfab, or you can use by attribution models, but be sure to follow the licensing rules. All of my models, which you can find on Gumroad or Blendswap for free, are CC0. I have other videos and community showcases on great resources for free models, but sort by CC0 on Blendswap or Polyhaven is usually my preferred route. As a general word of advice for people who are new to making covers or doing commission work, it's especially important, in my opinion, to save time on these types of elements. Supervisors or customers can be very particular about what they want, and it's easy to see your five hours of careful modeling and shading go out the window because the client doesn't like the way it looks. I had this happen to me quite recently. Following the same train of thought, I will say it's best to get a minimum viable product early on to discuss, with the understanding that it represents a jumping off point. I find early feedback can be quite helpful, so much so that I always ask potential clients for a sketch of what they had in mind. They don't have to be great artists, just a simple sketch and some bullet points is often a great starting place. Compared to journal figures, covers are much more in the realm of art, and an aesthetically pleasing cover takes a careful eye. Camera angles, lighting, color palettes, and other artistic details vary enormously and are well outside the scope of this video. That said, there are some simple camera settings that are worth knowing about. 
If you go ahead, select your camera, and come down to the Object Data Properties, you'll have access to all kinds of different adjustments. Focal length is one of the first ones that I like to reach for. If I can't quite get everything to fit in scene, or if I want to zoom in more, then it might be time to change the focal length. Crudely, a higher focal length will zoom in. A lower focal length will zoom out to a wider angle. In terms of working in Blender, I tend to open up Viewport Display and adjust the Passpartout option up to about 0.95. That will almost black out everything in the surrounding area, and this helps me focus on what I'm actually looking at in the frame. You can also enable a number of different guides, such as thirds, center, diagonal, and the golden ratio under the composition guides, and that may help you structure your scene. In terms of moving around and navigating with your camera, if you hit N to open the side panel and come to view, you can choose lock camera to view, and this will allow you to navigate freely through Blender, focusing on whatever element of your scene you'd like. This is enormously useful for framing, but be careful to turn off camera to view when you are not trying to guide the camera. If you accidentally move, the position of the camera is not recorded and it will not undo if you try and reset it. So Control-Z will not work for adjusting the camera after this. For lighting, where possible, I like to use HDRIs or high dynamic range images. When appropriate, I'll use the HDRI as a background element Again, making sure it is available under a CC0 license. I tend to get most of mine from polyhaven.com, but Blender comes bundled with a number of pre-built options. You can see a few of them here, and then a number of extras that I have added. If you want to know how to use the built-in HDRIs or how to set up a regular HDRI, very simply, you just come to Environment Texture, or the World setting, rather, World Properties, and under the Color tab, choose Environment Texture. Navigate to wherever you place the HDRI, and then select it. So if you see here, this is the folder where I keep many of mine. And if we are in a rendered view, then we should eventually be able to see that by unchecking scene world. And there we go. We can now see the HDRI. I can also just use the lighting by selecting film transparent. In some cases, custom lighting of your scene is the way to go. Lighting alone is the subject of entire courses on art and is well beyond the scope of what I will cover here. For more information, I strongly recommend Blender Guru's videos on lighting for beginners as a starting point. In terms of general scene setup, I'm very fond as well of using a camera tracking backdrop. I have a separate video on this that I've linked for anyone interested. I also like to align text to the camera using the same trick, so I can see how the finished piece will look with the journal name. If I were to do that right now, I would simply hit Shift A, add in a text object, we'll hit Tab for edit mode and change this to Journal. And then I will come down to the object constraints, choose copy rotation, and I'll copy the rotation of the camera. I can now move this around freely. I've done that by hitting G and I'll scale this up, put that in the top corner. And this would help me see what this would look like when I had the name of the journal. I could also add things like the issue number and volume, et cetera, right here. And that's just nice for framing. Generally speaking, journals do not actually want this text here. They will add it themselves. So just make sure that you uncheck it in the rendered view so it won't actually show up in your scene. In terms of rendering, cycles is really the way to go for covers. So if you come to the render properties, you can change from EV to cycles. And if you have a GPU that is going to be useful, change to GPU compute. Covers are still frames, and the extra features that cycles provides, such as holdout and shadow catcher for backdrops, are extremely valuable. In some cases where I want to work with glowing objects, I might reach for EV during setup, but I will use compositing in cycles to get the final glowing look. The vast majority of my cover art and most of the cover art I've seen looks like it's done using cycles. In the past, I've pointed to a number of different render settings to optimize. However, the upcoming release of Cycles X with Blender 3.0 in December will likely change many of those settings and promises to generally speed most renders. When I find a suitable guide in the future, I'll come back and link it in the description of this video. And that's it for my very simple advice for getting started making journal covers primarily using Blender. Like I said, this will be a reference point for more walkthrough style videos. I've showcased my large collection of reference images before, and from here I'll be making some longer videos, breaking down specific covers, figures, or other scientific visualizations, including animations. I'll also be touching more directly on some time-saving tools and on add-ons that I find useful for using Blender professionally. If you make journal covers, with or without Blender, and have any other tips you'd like to share, I encourage you to add them in the comments below. I'll close off with my opinion on doing this work as a student. If you are a student making your own cover or animations or figures because you enjoy it or have the skills to do so, fantastic. That said, the skill set required for quality scientific visualization is its own profession, and nobody should be getting your work for free unless you want it that way. Easier said than done sometimes, but I would be disappointed with myself and with the mission of this channel if I didn't make my position on this clear. And with that, thanks for coming out. 
If you enjoyed this video or found any of the suggestions useful, consider subscribing or sharing it with your friends and colleagues. As always, a big thank you to my supporters on Patreon who help make these videos possible. There are plenty more regular breakdowns, assets, and tutorials coming soon. Until then, I hope you have yourselves a great old day.